The Shivat Zion, the return to Zion, in the days of Ezra and Nehemiah, was a heroic period which brought the Jewish people back to the land of Israel following the Babylonian exile. This Tkufa, this period, saw an ingathering of exiles, the building of the Second Temple in Yerushalayim, thank you, and a resettlement of the Jewish people throughout the land of Israel. Ezra and Nehemiah, they lead both a political and spiritual renaissance, attempting to restore the Jewish nation to their glory. But despite all of their Herculean efforts, as we'll see, the movement failed to capture the glory that once was. And I think this period in Jewish history demands our attention as the challenges that they face are so similar in so many ways to the very challenges that we face today. It's uncanny. I mean, history is repeating itself in front of our very eyes. And I, I only wish that I would have learned about this period earlier. They don't, they don't teach Ezra and Nehemiah in the Yeshiva Day School and High School system, I, I, at least in the Yeshiva Day Schools and High Schools that I went to. But so this morning, I'd like to look together with you at the return to Tzion in the days of Ezra and Nehemiah and our own contemporary return to Tzion because I, I, I believe, as I said, history is really repeating itself in front of our own eyes and there's so many lessons to be learned. The book of Ezra begins here in source number one with the Hatzarat Koresh, how King Cyrus, in the first year of his rule, instructs the Jewish people to return to their land and rebuild their holy temple. It's incredible. Take a look here at source number one. This is Ezra, Perak Aleph, Pesukim Aleph through Gimel. Uvishnat achat lekoresh melech paras lichlot dvar Hashem ipi yemia. He hear Hashem at ruach koresh melech paras vayaver kol bechol malchuto vegam b'michtav lemor. And in the first year of Koresh, the king of Persia, the consummation of the word of the Lord by the mouth of Yirmiyo, this is an allusion to Yirmiyo, Perek Chavtet, right? Hashem roused the spirit of Koresh and he proclaimed throughout his kingdom and he issued this proclamation in writing as well. Here, Pasuk Bet, Ko Amar Koresh Melech Paras, Kol Mamlechot Haaretz Natan Li Hashem, Thus says the king of Koresh, thus says the uh, Koresh king of Persia, rather, all the kingdoms in the earth have been given to me by Hashem, the God of heavens. First of all, incredible that he recognizes our God. That's first of all. And he has commanded me by, maybe uh, a reference to the prophet Isaiah, in uh, Chapter 44, Perak Mem Dalet, and 45, Mem Hey, to build him a house in Yerushalayim, which is in Yehuda. And the next Pasuk, where he gives a charge to the Jewish people and encourages them to make Aliyah. This is incredible. Mivachem mikol amo, yielokav imo, vial Yerushalayim, asher biyuda, viven et beit Hashem elokei Yisrael, hu elokim asher biyushalayim. Any and all Jew wherever they live, from their place, may they go up to Yerushalayim, okay? And uh, this, is, this is incredible. Let him build a house of the Lord who is in Yerushalayim. Again, recognizing the God of Israel, recognizing our right to Yerushalayim, to Jerusalem, and encouraging the Jewish people to make Aliyah. I mean, he sounds like a tremendous religious Zionist here. King Koresh. Okay, And this is referred to as Hatzarat Koresh, the Koresh Declaration. We have a parallel passage at the very end of Sefer Divrei Hayamim. And the picture right below here on your sheets is the Cyrus Cylinder. It's a clay cuneiform chronicle. Try saying that three times fast. A clay cuneiform chronicle of Persian Median history from the 6th century BCE. And you can see it today in the British Museum. And here on the left is a picture of me looking at it. <laughs> okay. My little cap there in London. And whenever I visit the British Museum, I always make a beeline straight to the British, straight to, straight to the Cyrus Cylinder. Because for me, this is a, a, an artifact of, of such tremendous significance for the Jewish people, both historically 
and, and for our contemporary return to Tzion, as we'll see in a moment. So this is a, a fascinating uh, artifact here that, as I said, resides in the British Museum in London. Cyrus, in his life, commissions it to be written. It gives his genealogy, his pedigree, his yichus, as we would say, and it touts his accomplishments. Among them, how he allowed these ancient peoples to return to their ancestral homelands and rebuild their temples. Now, it doesn't refer to the Jewish people or the Holy Temple in Jerusalem explicitly, but it sounds an awful lot like what we just read, what we have in Sefer Ezra and Divrei Hayamim. And so significant is the role of Koresh that in Yeshayahu, Perek Memhei, he's referred to as Mashiach. Parenthetically, he's the only individual that's called Mashiach in the entire Tanakh. Why is he called Mashiach? Well, because he is the destined one, the anointed one, literally, the one who is charged with the task of calling the Jewish people back home. And so the book of Ezra and Nehemi go on to describe a series of aliyot, periods of repatriation to Eretz Yisrael, but initially only 42,360 returned, together with Shesh Bazar and Zerubbabel. And as we'll see, most chose to stay in Bavel. So here you have Melech Koresh, right? Cyrus the Great, that's what he was called, Cyrus the Great, leader of the free world, the most powerful individual at the time, who calls on the Jewish people to return home and build their holy temple in Jerusalem, and his call falls on deaf ears. The Jewish people don't heed the call. So as I mentioned, initially as is recorded in Sefer Ezra, 42,360 returned. And then you have subsequent aliyot uh, after the second temple had already been built. Ezra himself ascends with a small contingent followed by Nehemiah's aliyah. But tragically, the overwhelming majority of Jews did not return to the land of Israel during the second commonwealth. Sound familiar? And we'll see Many of the challenges that they faced are the very challenges that we face today, okay? So if you take a look here uh, at source number two, this is from Igmaran and Masachet Ketubot and Daf Chafhei. Actually, this is from the comments of Rashi to that passage there. The Gemara records how Lav Kulhu Saluk, that most of the Jews did not ascend. And Rashi explains, Ruban Nisharu Bebavel, as I mentioned just a few moments ago, that the majority chose to stay in Babylonia. And he, he draws, he's not quoting the, the verse verbatim, but he, he uh, draws on the pasuk in Ezra Perek Bet, the second chapter, which says that only 42,360 returned initially. Okay. Now, just the context there, it's something that we've spoken about in the past, the Gemara there talks about how the mitzvah of chala, and, and the Rambam extends it to all trumot in ma'asrot, require biat kulchem, require all the Jews, or at least the majority of the Jews, according to some, to be living in Israel. We won't get into how we define that, because the Pasuk says, bevoachem el ha'aretz. So the Gemara there says that when they came back with Ezra and Nehemiah, these mitzvot were not on a Torah level, because they did not have... Biat kulchem, which the pasuk requires. The pasuk, in the context of the mitzvah of the mitzvah chala, which we read not too long ago, and at the end of Parshat Shlach says, "Bevoachem el haaretz." You're going to observe this when you enter the land. It requires biat kulchem. Okay. So, uh, so the Gemara says, "Lav kulhu saluk." They didn't all come back, and here Rashi explains. Yes, most of them chose to stay in Bavel. Yes, question. The ten lost tribes could have come back. The ten lost tribes. We spoke about that a few weeks ago, right? And and. Right, so one of the reasons why I chose this topic this week is because we've been discussing the Ten Lost Tribes and we've been discussing the mitzvah of Yishu Eretz Yisrael, the mitzvah to reside in the land of Israel. Okay, so take a look here at source number three. Um, actually, before, before we look at source number three, um, I, I just wanted to, to mention, uh, as students of Tanakh, you all know that the prophets Chagai, Zachariah, and Malachi are constantly beseeching the people to return and rebuild and finish the c construction of the Beit HaMikdash, which took years. 
And Ezra and Nehemiah make a brave attempt at gathering up the people. But again, their words fall on deaf ears. And this is also described in many sources throughout Chazal. If you take a look here at source number three, this is a Medrash Tanchuma. At Motse, Kishegalu Lebavelma, Ezra Omer Lahem, Alu Leretz Yisrael, Velohayu Mevakshim. Right? When they were exiled to Bavel, the Medrash records here, that Ezra went around and told them to come and make Aliyah, and they didn't listen. They, didn't, they weren't interested. Okay? Even our spiritual leaders didn't come back. Ezra chapter 8 describes how there were very few Levim that returned. According to the Talmud, we'll come back to this in a few moments, but according to the Talmud, in a number of places, Ezra penalizes the Levim by taking the first, uh, the first tie, the Ma'aser Rishon, which is reserved for the Levim and giving it instead to who? To the Kohanim, the Gemara says. And even the Kohanim who returned were few in number. According to the Talmud, the second temple service was conducted only by four watches of Kohanim as opposed to 24 watches, which you had in the first temple. And what's fascinating is that you have Jewish communities across the world that maintain traditions of actually being visited by Ezra and petitioned to return and how they refused and all sorts of tragedies ensued. Rav Yaakov Sapir, who was a world explorer traveling in the 19th century and documenting his travels, he visits the Jewish community of Yemen and records their rich history. And he describes all the legends he was told and uh, how the Jewish community maintains this tradition that they were founded 42 years before the destruction of the first temple. They created a community called Aden, Right, which you have today, it's a port city in Yemen, which they called Gan Eden, Aden Eden, okay? And he records as well how the community was visited by Ezra and refused to, to come back. First, Ezra sent letters, he records, and then he goes there and they say, wait a minute, how do you know that this is going to be the final redemption? Maybe we'll be exiled again. Maybe the second temple will be destroyed just as the first. Okay, so Ezra, according to this account, becomes angry with them. And this is a theme you see in a number of these different accounts. And he places a hex on them, a curse on them. Okay. And it's, it's recorded uh, by Rav Shlomo Adeni from Aden that, uh, yeah, the community of Yemen was subsequently punished with, with poverty, both physical poverty and spiritual poverty. Now, you could ask, well, physical poverty, okay, but spiritual poverty, we have a lot of great Torah giants that come from Yemen and they preserve the tradition. Okay, that's, that's a tradition that he had. And by the way, uh, Rav Yaakov Sapir records how Ezra in turn curses them. He returns the blessing, you know, quote unquote. Uh, and and I'm, I'm sorry, they, they return the blessing. He records they return the blessing and curse Ezra. Ezra cursed them that they... Uh, will suffer from poverty, physical and spiritual poverty. They, in turn, return the blessing, quote-unquote, and that he will not be buried in Israel. And, um, and by the way, uh, there are different traditions as to where he's buried, okay? Um, the Jewish historian Josephus writes that Ezra was buried in Yerushalayim, but there is a tomb in Iraq, on the western shore of the Tigris that is popularly believed to be the burial place of Ezra. So who knows? Who knows? Uh, and, and to this day, Rav Yaakov Sapir also records that they won't give their children the name Ezra in Yemen. So I don't know. I don't know if the Yemenite community still keeps this uh, pact not to give their children the name. But you have similar traditions among the Jews of Persia, for instance, when uh, uh, they record when Ezra came to visit the Jewish community in Gilad, Persia. Uh, the people answer that the land of Israel is fraught with war while they live in peace and tranquility and serenity and enjoy land and water and air. And Ezra curses them that their good situation will fade like a passing cloud and curse them that not even a minyan of, uh, for prayer, minyan tefillah, will, will remain. And again, similar to what Rav Yaakov uh, Sapir records, um, you have it recorded that they curse Ezra that he will not be buried in the land of Israel. And again, as I said, while, while Josephus has, uh, has such a tradition that he was indeed buried in Yerushalayim, 
there is a grave that is associated with him in Iraq today. So, uh, and you have other traditions, uh, the uh, comments of the Abravanel to Malachim Bet, that the Jews of Spain also refused to ascend because they too were concerned that this, this Shivat Zion, this return to Zion might only be temporary, that Yerushalayim might be conquered once again. Rav Moshe Makir records the tradition that the Tefillah of Emet V'yatsiv, which we say alludes, and, and alludes to the final redemption, but it was composed by this community to demonstrate that they were indeed firm in their emunah, even if they refused to ascend together with Ezra. The Jewish community of Worms in Germany maintains that the Crusades were a punishment. The first Crusades of 1096, which decimated the tripartite community that is known as Ahu, Ahu, uh, which, which stands for, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, not, not Ahu. Uh, I'm, I'm thinking of uh, Shum, Kilo Shum. I'm mixing up my tripartite communities. <laughs> there's, there's Ahu, which is Altona, Hamburg, Wandsbeck, and, uh, and then there's Shum. Speyer, Vermeise, and Mainz. Speyer, Worms, and Mainz, okay? So in 1096, the first, commu- the first Crusades uh, decimated the communities of Spire, Worms, and Mainz. And the Jews of Worms have this, uh, this, this tradition that they've passed down that the reason for the Crusades, the reason for the punishment was that they refused to go back with Ezra. And they, they wrote, according to this tradition, according to this account, they wrote to Ezra and, and said that now, you know, we'll... <laughs> We'll come to Jerusalem for the Shalosh Regalim, for the three pilgrimage festivals. Right? Sound familiar? Right? A lot of Jews, I'm not going to make Aliyah, but I'll, I'll visit Israel three times a year. I'll come for the Chagim. I'll own an apartment in Jerusalem, which I'll leave empty most of the year. I'll send my kids to Israel, to camp, to, to yeshiva. And they said, you know, you return to the Jerusalem the Great, and we'll stay here in the small Jerusalem. They, that's what they called worms, right? So uh, a similar tradition, by the way, you have among the Jews of Ephrani, Morocco, that they believe that they were descendants of the tribe of Ephraim, right? We spoke about the Ten Lost Tribes a, no- a number of weeks ago, and they also maintained a tradition that, that uh, they refused the requests of Ezra and were met with harsh punishments under Byzantine rule, okay? As I mentioned, uh, it, it's recorded in Nehemiah, uh, that the, um, sorry, Ezra, it's recorded in Sefer Ezra. You know, Ezra and Nehemiah were once one Sefer. It's recorded in Ezra Perak Chet. We'll come to Nehemiah Perak Chet in a few moments. It's recorded in Ezra Perak Chet that Ezra looked for Levim and they were, they were hard to come by. They were hard to find. It says that, uh, here, I don't, I don't think it's on the sheets, but let me see if I have, if I can pull up the, uh, the psukim, uh, yes, it says, it says there that he looked, he looked for, among the people for kohanim, for levim, he didn't find. So if you're familiar with the Jerban community, a fascinating community with a lot of rich traditions, so the, the Jews of Jerba maintain a tradition that Ezra came to them. Jerba is an island off the coast of Tunisia. So they maintain a tradition that Ezra came to them looking for Levim. Again, Levim were scarce. Even today, some explain that the reason why we don't have so many Levim today. Right? Oftentimes, if you have a shul that just has a couple of Levim, they, they get the aliyah all the time. Right? Levim are scarce. So the Jews of Jerba maintain a tradition that Ezra went there looking for Levim. And they refused to ascend together with him. And again, argued, as many of these communities did, the Holy Temple is only going to be destroyed another time, a second time. How do we know that this is going to be a a lasting redemption? There's no reason for us to ascend ultimately to be subsequently exiled. And, And according to their tradition, Ezra cursed them and said that all Levim on the island will die within one year. And they believe that the effect still, the, the curse is still in effect today, that the curse still remains today. And so if any Levium visit, they, they make sure not to live, to live there for a year. Okay, because he said any, any Levium on the island will die that same year. Now, uh, scholars and historians 
We'll debate the historicity of these traditions and accounts. But I think there's a message here because it expresses the very real tragedy that most Jews did not return together with Ezra and Nehemiah, instead choosing to remain in Babel. The people failed to heed the call instead of participating in this incredible moment in history. Sound familiar? Okay. And so the question is why? Why didn't more Jews return? Where were they? What were they doing? Who were they? So take a look here at source number four. This is Rashi in his comments to Kiddushim Daf Samachtet. We'll come back to the, uh, the Gemara in Kiddushim because the Gemara in Kiddushim has a lot of interesting material about Ezra and this period. But there, the Gemara records how, again, Ezra is looking, Va'avina Ba'am, this pasuk that uh, we just quoted from Ezra, Perek Chet, it's pasuk Tetvav, Ezra chapter 8, verse 15. And there it says that Ezra, again, was looking, looking for Kohanim, looking for Levim. And the Gemara and Rashi explain where they were, okay? And why there were so few Levim, Rashi here explains that the Levim, as we know from Tehilim, Kuf Lamed Zion, did not want to sing the songs of God on foreign soil. Right? Eich nashir et shir Hashem al admat nechar. So according to Chazal, they cut their fingers. They cut their fingers. They, they bit their fingers. They cut their fingers so that they would not be able to play musical instruments. Okay? And then take a look where I've underlined. This is so important. Rashi continues and writes, Umin hakshirim lo matza. And among those Kohanim and Levim and kosher Jews, we'll come to the issue of, of Yuchasin and, and pedigree in a few moments because assimilation and intermarriage were rampant during this period while the Jews were in Bavel. So among the kosher ones, Ezra couldn't find any. Because they were living in Bavel in tranquility. And those who ascended to Jerusalem, they were poverty stricken and they had to work very hard. And there was fear of everything, right? Uh, all around the security situation, there was a, a, a real fear, a concern for their environments, for the what we may call today in modern Hebrew the matzava bitchoni. Okay, so what Rashi is telling us here is that even among the kosher Jews, Ezra had a hard time convincing them to come on Aliyah. Why? Because they were living in safety and security in Bavel. They were living in tranquility and peace. They were content comfortable, wealthy. They had achieved prominence, power, and influence. Bavel had become a center of Torah study, as we know. It was a vibrant Jewish community. I'm sure there were shuls, yeshivos, mikvos. I'm sure they even had kosher pizza shops. Right? Every Jewish community needs a kosher pizza shop. It's one of the first things you ask when you're looking for a community to move to. Are, are there yeshivos for the kids? Are there shuls? Mikvos, is there an Eruv? And of course, the next question is, what about the kosher restaurants? Is there a kosher restaurant? Okay. And in contrast, the land of Israel was empty and barren. Returning to Zion meant entering into the unknown, a barren wilderness. It was a risk that not many were ready to take. Uh, as Rashi says here, there was poverty, there were safety concerns. Okay, sound familiar, <laughs> right? As they say, how do you make a million dollars in Israel? Come with two million or come with 10 million, okay? And the nature of the return to Zion in the days of Ezra and Nehemiah was vastly different than in the first conquest of the land in the days of Yehoshua. And a number of places the Talmud contrasts this and describes how this time there were no wonders and miracles. Take a look here at source number five. This is Agmara at the beginning of Masechet Brachot and, and Daf Dalid. 
ראויים היו ישראל לעשות להם נס בימי עזרא, כדרך שנעשה להם בימי יהושע בן נון, אלא שגרם החטא. In the days of Yahushu experienced all sorts of wonders and miracles, except Ella Shegaramachet. The sin, somehow the sin prevented it. Now, what chet is that exactly? We don't know. We don't know. Maybe it's the, the chet of, of assimilation and intermarriage, which we'll come to in a few moments. Maybe the sin that prevented the wonders and miracles from taking place, the same wonders and miracles that took place. Upon the entry into the land with Yehoshua, during the Kivush of Yehoshua, maybe the, the sin was the very sin of not coming back to Israel en masse. The sin of only a small minority coming. The sin of the majority of Jews remaining in Bavel. Again, a place where they were very comfortable and content. That's how some, like the Kuzari, understand what prevented all the special wonders and miracles, and why the very nature, as we'll see in a, a moment, of the experience in Yerushalayim, in the Beit HaMikdash, was different. Okay? So here, take a look at source number seven. This is a fascinating, fascinating passage in the Gemara and Yoma, on Daf Tet. The Gemara relates, Reish Lakish have a biyardna. Reish Lakish was bathing in the Jordan River. He wanted to come out of the river. He was ready to, to come up from the water. And so Rabbi Barbachana, one of the Chachmei Bavel, gave him a hand. Okay? Amarle, and Rish Lakish says to him, Eloha Sanina Lechu. Now there are two ways of reading this. You could either read it like, by God, Right? I hate you. <laughs> or you are hated. Or, depending on how you punctuate it, you could read it. Eloha sanin l'chu. God hates you. And he begins to criticize the Jews of Bavel for not returning with Ezra and Nehemiah. Again, <laughs> you could read this one of two ways. He could be saying, by God, like an expression, you know, I hate you, you are hated. Or, God hates you. For not returning, and he brings a pasuk from Shir Hashirim Perechet, which refers to both Kesef silver and and a luach erez, a a uh, a wall or a, a a door made of cedar wood, and he continues and says, "Had you made yourselves like a wall and ascended like a wall?" We actually spoke about this a few weeks ago when we spoke about one of the three oaths. Which the first of which is, we spoke about the three of the first of which is do not ascend like a wall. Some say it's, maybe this is, they were supposed to, during the second commonwealth, ascend like a wall. Okay? <laughs> which negates the three oaths. We, we spoke about that a few weeks ago. But here, Reish Lakish is saying, had you ascended like a wall, then you would have been made like Kesef. Had you ascended like a wall, the elitem kulchem bimezra, and Kulchem, all of you would have ascended to Israel in the days of Ezra, then you would be compared to Kesef, to silver. She'en rekev sholidba, which doesn't rot. Right? Yes, it tarnishes a little bit. You got to polish it, right? But it doesn't rot. However, Achshav, he continues and says, now, Shalitem, that only a few of you, the majority stayed in Bavel, only some of you came. Kidaltot nimshaltem, you are compared to doors made of what? Ke'erez, of cedar wood, sheharekev shleitbo, which ultimately rots. So here, here, Reish Lakish is criticizing the fact that, he's very critical, the fact that the overwhelming majority of Jews did not return with Ezra and Nehemiah, and did not make themselves like a wall. And if you turn the page here in source number eight, okay, Rashi there explains, Sanin l'chu, l'chol b'nei bavel, shelo alu b'mei Ezra, u'meno shechina milavo, milashuv l'sharot b'vayit sheni. Right? As I said, some explain the fact that they didn't get all sorts of miracles upon their entry into the land because 
the majority didn't come. Rashi here says something else. Because the majority didn't come with Ezra and Nehemiah. So all the miracles and wonders that took place on a daily basis in the Holy Temple itself did not take place during Tkufat Bayit Sheni. Okay? And, and this also, as I said, is, is the opinion of Rabbi Yudha Halevi and his Kuzari, which we'll take a look at it uh, together here in a moment. But the very nature, the very nature of the religious experience, the spiritual experience in the Second Temple was different. Okay? The Mishnah, the Gemara talk about all these different things. The Shekhinah wasn't there, the fire that would consume the offerings and the smoke from the incense that would go straight up. Okay? The Urim Vitumim, all these things were absent from the Second Temple. Now, Rabbi Yehuda Halevi, the author of the Kuzari, as we know, was a, a great lover of Zion. He wrote the famous Kina, which we recite on Tisha B'Av morning, Tzion, Haloti, Shali. Right? He famously said that I am in the West, but my heart is in the East. And according to the tradition, he finally made it to the shores of Israel and got on his hands and knees to kiss the ground, to, to roll in her soil, as is described at the end of Masachet Ketubot, how our sages expressing their love for the land would roll around in the dust of the earth and, and kiss her soil and rocks. And according to the tradition, he was trampled by an Arab on horseback. Okay? Now it's a question whether that story, how accurate that is, uh, whether he even made it to Israel, whether, how, how, what were the circumstances of his death. I'll leave that up to the historians to debate, but certainly the story expresses something that we, we do know about him, which was his great love for the land of Israel. So in his major work, one of the classic works of Jewish philosophy, the Kuzari, which he had written in Arabic, it's translated here into Hebrew, he's having this discussion with the, the Khazar king, the Melech Kuzari, right? You have the, the Haver, this friend, the wise individual, this rabbi, and this king, the king of the Khazars, and they're having this debate and this discussion about Judaism. And there, in, in the second section of the Kuzari, Rav Yehuda Levi goes ahead and records a lot of our sages' praises for the land of Israel, some of which we saw a few weeks ago when we discussed the mitzvah of Yishu Eretz Yisrael, and how Eretz Yisrael has such a special quality, and he praises her. And then the Kuzari asks a very damaging question. So Nu, where are you guys? If Israel is so special, why didn't you come back? Why didn't you return to Israel? Why didn't you make Aliyah and Mass? And he answers here in source number nine. Yeah, you're absolutely right. Hovashtani Melech Kuzar. You have embarrassed me. Right? Other translations from the Arabic into Hebrew have it. You found the place of my makom cherpati, the, the place of my, uh, my shame. Okay? And then he goes on. And he writes, yes, look where I've underlined. Like we said, only some of them in the days of Ezra and Nehemiah returned and settled. And most of them stayed in Bavel. And, and even their leaders, their great ones, remained in Bavel. Right? They desired the Galut, the exile. Because they didn't want to separate themselves from their, their place from their inyanehem. What does that mean? What does it, mean? it means that they're, they're inyonim, you might say. They, they didn't want to leave their positions. They had great jobs. Right? They didn't want to leave their, their beautiful five-bedroom homes with the two-car garage. They didn't want to leave their great jobs. That's what he's saying. V'shem al amar, and perhaps now he draws on shir hashirim, which of course we know is at its very essence, a story of missed opportunity. That's certainly how Rav Salavechik understood Shir Hashirim, and that's the pshat. Ani You know, the whole Megillah of Shir Hashirim, the, the Dod and the Raya are expressing their love for one another, describing each other in graphic detail. And finally, 
In the fifth chapter, the climax of the story, he comes to her garden and she's asleep, right? He comes to her garden and she's sleeping. Her heart's awake. There's something there, right? There's a little, there's a little bit of something. There's a little Zionism, right? If you will. But she's asleep. So he writes, yes, that's, that's the galut. That's, that's a reference to the galut. And the, the lave that is awakened, that is the nivuah. In other words, those are the prophets that are telling them, come, ascend. Kol do fake. He comes and he knocks and she hears the knocks. Right? That's kriyat elokim lashuv, the kuzari writes. That's the call, the divine call to return. Okay? Sheroshinim latal. Her hair is full of dew. That's the shechina, he writes. But what happens? Oh, she says, you know what? I can't come to the door right now. It's so late. Pashatati et kutonti. He says, that's al atzlutam lashuv. When she says, I've, I've taken off my garment. Right? I'm not dressed. I'm wearing my pajamas already. Rachatzti et raglai. She says, I've, I've washed my feet already. How can I soil them coming to the door? He says, that's the laziness. Al atzlutam lashuv. That's this missed opportunity. Dodi shalach yadomi nachor. My lover stuck his hand through the keyhole. I mean, it's so, it's so tragic. He's reaching for her. And the Kuzari writes, Al Ezra, that's Ezra. This is Ezra, Nehemiah, and the other prophets that are telling them to come and arise, right? And then what happens? It's so tragic. By the time she gets to the door, and she's covered in all sorts of myrrh and oils, and her hand slips off the doorknob. It's so tragic. But by the time she opens the door, the three saddest words in all of Shehashim, perhaps the three saddest words in all of Tanakh. Dodi chamak v'avar, my beloved left. He turned away, he's gone. It's too late, and she chases after him, but it's too late. Okay, it's too late. And so you know that Rav Salavechik in his famous essay, Kol Dodi Do Fake, uh, he draws on this theme of missed opportunity in Shir Hashirim, and he has a section, the Shesh Defikot, the six knocks, asks us to hear Hashem knocking on the door of history with the establishment of the state of Israel, six different knocks. Okay. So who did return? The Mishnah here in source number 10, at the end of Masachet Kiddushin, it's the Mishnah at the beginning of Perak Asar Yuchusin, records that those who ascended with Ezra were plagued with all sorts of problematic or questionable lineage, all sorts of problematic yichus. There were chalalim, disqualified kohanim, there were converts and slaves, mamzerim, nitinim, shtukim, people whose paternity is unknown, asufim, foundlings, people that are, you know, gathered up, like they left them, I wouldn't say on the, the steps of a church, but maybe on the steps of a shul or something in Bavel. Okay? And... And so Ezra didn't know who's Jewish, who's not Jewish, who's, who's a valid Kohen, who's a valid Levi. As we said, Ezra Perekhet describes how Ezra is looking for Kohanim and Leviim. Okay? And so trying to address this confusion, Ezra instructs those with questionable lineage to ascend together with him to Israel. So the Rabbanuta Roshit, if you will, the chief rabbinate here in Israel, could confront the issue and deal with the issue and hopefully prevent intermarriage. Take a look here at source number 11. This is a famous line in the Gemara in Kiddushin and Daf Samach Tet. Lo ala Ezra mi Bavel ad she asak kesolet nikia ve'ala. Ezra did not ascend from Bavel to Israel until he made it like fine sifted flour. And only then did he ascend. What does it mean, fine sifted flour? What does that mean? Meaning, he, he got rid of all the, the problematic questions, right? He, he, he sifted through all those questions and issues of, of Yuchusin and lineage and the questions of who's, who's a Jew, okay? So, you see, they were plagued with, with assimilation and intermarriage and who's a Jew, who's not a Jew, who requires conversion, who can serve as a Kohen, this person, his last name is Cohen, but he wants to marry a divorcee, right? You know, he's a Baal Tshuva, you know, can you allow him to? Sound familiar? Right? These are the very questions that we face today. And, and where do they give you a problem? When you make Aliyah. Then it's the chief rabbi who's got to look into it, right? And that's exactly what the Gemara records. That Ezra ascends to Israel and 
deals with it here in Israel and lets the rabbis of Israel deal with it. Okay? The Rabbanut Rashid. Again, the very same challenges that we face today. And as I said, there was assimilation and intermarriage. By the way, intermarriage is called in Sefer Ezra and Nehemiah the transgression of the exile, the sin of the exile. Okay, sound familiar? Ezra responds by mourning and fasting and he weeps and he prays and makes a formal confession of this sin in front of the Holy Temple. And he gathers the Jewish people together and enters them into a covenant to divorce their foreign wives. Okay, uh, Ezra calls out, by the way, in in chapter 9, those Kohanim who had married women which were prohibited to them, telling them to divorce their wives, right? And it's recorded how the Jewish people had assimilated to such a degree that Shabbat became a market day, imagine. And there's a famous passage in Ezra, Perechet. We've spoken about this passage in the past here. I'm sorry, it's in Nehemia Perichet. We spoke about Ezra. Ezra Perichet, we spoke about this morning. Nehemia Perichet, we've spoken about in the past. This famous passage where in Nehemia Perichet, it describes how Ezra gathers up the people together on Rosh Hashanah and he reads the Torah for them. And what happens? When he reads the Torah for them, they began to cry and weep. And they tell them, Ezra and Nehemia and the Jewish people and the leaders and the Levim, they say to them, no, no, no. Hayom Kadoshu Lashem. This is a holy day. Lashem Elokechem. Tashem your God. Alti Taplu. Don't mourn. The Altivku. Don't cry. Kivochim Kolaam Kishamam Divrei Et Divrei Torah. Because the people were crying and weeping when they heard the words of the Torah. Okay? And we explained in previous Shurim that from here, it's one of the sources that you see that you're not supposed to fast or mourn on Rosh Hashanah. Yes, it's a serious day. It's a day of judgment. But ultimately, it's a festival. And it's supposed to be celebrated. Okay? And we don't fast on Rosh Hashanah, we feast on Rosh Hashanah. So uh, the poskim draw on this verse here from Nehemiah Perichet, but Rashi there explains that the reason why they wept and cried and mourned is because they had not properly observed the Torah. All these years they had assimilated in Bavel. Perhaps the experience was additionally traumatic because the words of Torah were so foreign to them. Now, this was only a couple of generations. This wasn't, wasn't very long between the destruction of the first temple and the Shivat Zion in the days of Ezra and Nehemiah. But like we've seen in recent history, with the creation of the, the Soviet Union, the Bolshevik Revolution, 1917, until uh, whatever, Jews were given permission to come to Israel to practice their religion freely, openly, how in, in just a generation or two you can completely wipe out a religion and cause people to assimilate and intermarry to such a degree. It doesn't take a lot of time. That's one of the lessons. Again, sounds awfully familiar. In order to restore the Jewish people spiritually, Ezra and Nehemiah make a series of enactments, takanot, we'll come back to that in a moment. Nehemiah has the Jewish people sign a brit amana, a covenant of faith, to reaffirm their commitment to Torah and mitzvot, this was a spiritual renaissance. Chazal compare Ezra to Moshe Rabbeinu. Take a look here at source number 12. Tanya. It was taught in a bright Rabbi Yossi Omer. Ra'ui haya Ezra shetinaten Torah al yadoli Yisrael ilmale lo kidma Moshe. It would have been fitting for the Torah to be given to the Jewish people by the hand of Ezra were it not that Moshe came before him. Now, Ezra is called Ezra HaSofer. According to Chazal, he's busy fixing and correcting Sifrei Torah. There were mistakes that crept in the Torah scrolls that he had to correct. There's a Mishnah that refers to either a Sefer Ezra or perhaps the Sefer HaAzara or Sefer Azara, a Torah scroll that was left in the Azara in the courtyard of the Beit HaMikdash, just like Moshe left an authoritative Torah, so too Ezra, perhaps, it's called Sefer Ezra, Sefer Azara, okay? Ezra makes ten takanot, again, to restore the Jewish people spiritually. This is not only a physical return to their land, but this is a spiritual renaissance. Among them, reading Torah on Shabbat afternoons and Mondays and Thursdays, again, strengthening their connection and commitment to Torah and mitzvot, restoring the sanctity of Shabbat, the sanctity of the Jewish marriage, the Jewish home. Okay, you have here, source number 13, 10 different takanot, asara takanot tikain Ezra. Shekorin 
במנחה בשבת, we read the Torah at מנחה on שבת, וקוראים בשני ובחמישי, Mondays and Thursdays, ודנים בשני ובחמישי, courts meet, courts are in session, on Mondays and Thursdays, those were the market days when people came to the cities. ומחפשים בחמישי בשבת, ואוכלים שום בערב שבת. They would wash their garments. Again, because of the sanctity of Shabbat, they would eat garlic on Friday night. Okay, why? Garlic was believed to be an aphrodisiac. And the idea was that if a man would eat garlic on Friday night, he'd want to be intimate with his wife because a number of these takanot, as the Chatam Sofer and others explained, was to enhance the sanctity of the Jewish marriage, the Jewish home, because of all that intermarriage. Ezra was trying to combat intermarriage. Okay? So now, you might think eating garlic might repel one's spouse, but okay. Uh, he felt the opposite. And then, uh, yeah, other, other, other uh, things here related to uh, the mitzvah of tefillah, a woman immersing in the mikvah. Again, all about enhancing and reinforcing the Jewish marriage, the Jewish home. Okay? And what's fascinating is, despite all of the challenges that they faced, all of the problems, they imbued the land with a kiddusha, a holiness, a sanctity that exists until this very day. Right? Why, when we talk about Shemitah, this year's a Shemitah year, when we talk about the mitzvot of Trumot and Ma'asrot, we ask, well, where was this produce grown? Was it grown in the land of Israel that has Kiddushat Eretz Yisrael? Right? Or maybe was it grown in the Arava or down in Eilat? We spoke about Eilat the other week, if Eilat is considered part of Eretz Yisrael. Uh, regarding the question of is it permitted to leave Eretz Yisrael, what about Eilat, according to those who say you can't leave Eretz Yisrael? Is Eilat included in that prohibition? What's the status of Eilat? But what about Kiddushat Eretz Yisrael? So we say only the places where the Olei Bavel, those who together with Ezra and Nehemiah and before them ascended to the land of Israel, only those places that they settled have Kiddushat Eretz Yisrael. And that Kiddushat retains until this very day. With the initial conquest in the days of Yehoshua, once the temple was destroyed and we were exiled to Bavel, that kidusha was, was gone. Kid shalashata, velo kid shalatid lavo. The Biyari Shona, according to Chazal, at least, uh, according to most opinions, and the Rambam, it's, that, first, that first conquest, they, the sanctity didn't return. It wasn't forever. Kiddushah Shniyah, Kiddushah Lishatah, Kiddushah Latid Lavo. But the second Kiddushah, when they came and settled the land with Ezra and Nehemiah, that, that stays forever now. Okay, it's Machloket, but we paskin that Kiddushah Lishatah, Kiddushah Latid Lavo. That the land retains its sanctity. Okay, take a look here at source number 14. Kol sheichziku olei Mitzrayim v'nitkadesh Kiddushah Rishona, kevan shegalu, bitlu Kiddushatan. All the lands that were conquested by those who came up from Egypt with that first initial Kiddushah, once they were exiled, the Kiddushah is null and void. Because that just came about through conquest. But Kiddushah and Kiddushah and as I said, they, they imbued it with a sanctity that was not permanent. It only retained its sanctity for that period, for that moment in history, not for all of eternity. But once they came and sanctified it a second time with Ezra and Nehemiah, they imbued it with a sanctity that endures, that is there forever. So this has a tremendous, tremendous halachic import, as we explained, Okay. So while the group that did ascend was small and fraught with all sorts of problems of assimilation, Yuchasin, they possessed this courage to take that leap of faith and come back home. And by the way, we mentioned the, the names of the Kohanim that Ezra calls out and criticizes. The names of the families who ascend together with Ezra and Nehemiah are preserved for posterity. These were the brave souls who sacrificed everything, going into the unknown, demonstrating a great faith, 
These were the chalutzim, the initial chalutzim, who rolled up their sleeves and drained the swamps and built settlements and settled the land of Israel, partnering with God, bringing about the redemption. And it wasn't easy. And it happened biderech hateva, through the natural means, without miracles. Right? There were many who looked and saw, is this really redemption? Where are the miracles and wonders? Right? Why, why are we having to do all this work? Why are there all these secular Jews settling the land? These Jews who had assimilated and intermarried, right? Sound familiar? <laughs> History is repeating itself, okay? So, uh, Rav Salavechik explained that, yes, despite all their flaws, they, create, they created an, an eternal attachment by settling the land they, and, and imbuing it with the Kedusha that endures forever, they created an eternal attachment in the language of Vesalavechik. And in some ways, the second temple even rivaled the first. You know, the, the prophet Haggai says that the glory of the second temple is going to be greater than the first. And the Gemara explains that the second temple was greater in size and as well as the numbers it stood. The first temple stood for 410 years, according to Chazal. The second temple stood for 420 years. And while the first exile left the land completely barren, even after the destruction of the second temple, while certainly the population waned, but there, the Jewish people continued to maintain an uninterrupted presence in the land. Okay, now that we know, that's been recorded. Uh, Rav Hillel of Shklov, a close student of the Vilna Gon, records in the Sefer Kol HaTor, and there's a lot, there's a lot of uh, controversy surrounding the Sefer, but Kol HaTor, written by Hillel of Shklov, Hillel Rivlin of Shklov, by the way, uh, all the Rivlins today, including the uh, most recent president of Israel, is a descendant of this family. So, and they came with the Aliyah the Talmidei Hagra, the Vilna Gon, the Gra sends his students in the early part of the 19th century to come and make Aliyah. They make Aliyah in the early part of the 19th century to bring about redemption. So in Kolator, he records the teachings of the Vilna Gon about redemption. And there's a lot of very controversial statements. And some want to say, oh, it's not the Gra, because he talks about redemption taking place through the natural means, like what we have seen over the last century, okay? Um, and so uh, he writes there that a major principle of our master, the Gra, was that all of the activity with regards to the process of the ultimate redemption and the beginning of the redemption, the Atchal de Gula, he talks about the footsteps of the Mashiach there, all of it is going to be just like in the period of Ezra and Nehemiah and in the days of Cyrus the Great. In other words, it's going to happen through the natural means. And this is a theme that you find throughout the teachings of the students of the Gona Vilna. And in many ways, as we saw this morning, the story and struggle of Ezra and Nehemiah is so similar to ours today. It's uncanny. Yeah, a series of proclamations and pronouncements and declarations, not unlike the Hatzarat Koresh, the declaration of Cyrus the Great, lead to the establishment of the State of Israel. You have the Balfour Declaration in 1917. And by the way, there were many, many great rabbis at the time who heard echoes of the Cyrus Declaration when Balfour issued his famous declaration in 1917. In 1920, you have the San Remo Conference. You have the Partition of Palestine, Haftet bin November 1947, right? And the brave souls who chose to make Aliyah, the Chalutzim, who came over the last century plus and cast their lot with Jewish destiny, they rolled up their sleeves and, and built a land, built a country, built a nation. They came for different reasons. They weren't all religious, right? But that's what we saw during the return to Zion of the days of Ezra and Nehemiah. Like these chalutzim, they rolled up their sleeves and settled the land, they drained the swamps, and their courage and faith is why we are here today. The question of who is a Jew, 
still haunts us to this very day with all of our problems of, of lineage and intermarriage and conversions and who needs a conversion, whose conversion is recognized and whose isn't, as we, rate, we, we wait for Eliyahu Anavi, as it says in uh, the Mishnah Ediot, Eliyahu Anavi is going to come and clarify all these problems, according to Chazal. And we do struggle with assimilation and intermarriage and, and fight to preserve the Jewish character of the Jewish state. And just like that generation of Shivat Sion in the days of Ezra and Nehemiah, we too have been given the incredible opportunity to return to our ancestral homeland, to settle the land, to come on Aliyah. And sadly, just like in the days of Ezra and Nehemiah, the overwhelming majority choose instead to live their lives in the diaspora. The return to Sion in the days of Ezra and Nehemiah is a story of missed opportunity. How will our story end? That's the question. How will our story end? We live during confusing times, yes. Challenging times, yes. But we also live during exciting times. We live during miraculous times. What we're seeing here is nothing short of miraculous. We live at a unique moment in history. And I think we can learn a lot from the Shivat Zion in the days of Ezra and Nehemiah. We'll see you all, Bezrat Hashem, next week. Take care. Have a wonderful day.